beautiful creatures of the world and welcome back to Coffee with Carrie Lynn. It's a beautiful day in the far north of Maine up along the Canadian border in the crown of Maine and I hope it's a beautiful day wherever you are as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Friday. It's my favorite episode. Freaky Friday. It is time to let our hair down, think outside the box, let your imagination wander. Take the burdens of the week off your shoulders even if it's for a little while. Head into the weekend with a lighter heart in a more joyous mood. I promise you, all the drama... All the shenanigans you did not resolve this week will be waiting for you on Monday. That's why we call it Manic Monday. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, thank you for joining me here. Whether you are on YouTube or on Rumble, think about subscribing to my channel and give me a thumbs up if you are listening to me on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, or YouTube Music. Think about following my podcasts. Give me a five-star rating. Thumbs up, five-star ratings. Doesn't cost you guys anything. It's a way you can help your girl out. It just boosts me up in the algorithm and lets the algorithm know people are interested in this show. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, if you are watching me right now live, premiering on YouTube. I do premiere Freaky Fridays on YouTube. And I am in the comment section right now where we can live chat. We had a blast last week doing a little bit of live chat and while we watch the video. Also, I want to thank everybody who has commented on YouTube on the previous weeks of Freaky Friday. It's been great conversations in the chat. You guys have told amazing stories and we really did enjoy reading each and every one of them and we love having the interaction with you. If you have a story that's stranger than fiction, whether it's paranormal, supernatural, you want to talk about interdimensional travel, I'm your girl. You want to talk about glitches in the matrix? I'm there for you. I go down that rabbit hole often and it is a wild one. We love talking about aliens, whatever you can throw at us, any kind of histories, mysteries. We love talking about murder mysteries and thrillers. It's just another side of my personality. My life is just not homesteading, gardening, and, you know, prepping a pantry and listening to the chaos that's in the world. I do have other interests in life. And here we are on Friday. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, today I want to talk about magic, magical people, people that walk among us that can heal, whether they're healing you through a cup of tea, a tincture, or a liniment, whether they are healing you just by holding your hand as you have a conversation with them, there are also people that can perform absolute mysterious miracles and there's no scientific explanation for what those people do and how they do it. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, we are going to start in my grandmother's kitchen. We're going to talk a little bit about the magical being that she was. Way back when in the old days before, you know, doctors were readily avail available in the early years of civilization, people had to go out into nature and forage around for things that would treat what ailed them. As we progress into modern times, into modern medicine, uh, we left the knowledge of nature in nature. And we started what is now considered uh, following Western medicine. People like pills nowadays, ladies and gentlemen. They like things with immediate cures. When I was a child, I would not feel good, and I would go downstairs. We lived upstairs. My grandmother lived downstairs, and I would tell her I didn't feel good, and she would sit me at the kitchen table, and she would perform quite the magical ritual. First, she would lay the back of her hand on my forehead. She was looking for a fever. Then she would wiggle my ears, which I thought was absolutely hysterical, but she was looking for ear pain. She would press around my eyeballs, much like the doctor does, looking to see you wince because your sinuses are all folded up. Then she grabbed my grandfather's mag light, open your mouth and look down your gullet, see what was going on down there. And finally, last but not least, she would lay a hand on the front of your chest, lay a hand on the back of your chest, make you breathe in deeply three to six times. What she was doing was she was looking for phlegm rattle. She was uh, making sure that you didn't have any congestion in your chest. Then she would go to the stove. 
She would brew you up a special magic potion to drink. You would drink it. She would talk to you. And off to bed you'd go. And the next morning you wake up and you feel great. You were cured. And I really thought that my grandmother was a super amazing, powerful witch. Well, you know. Some things do get passed down generation to generation in my family on both sides. The thing of it was, while my grandmother did not know exactly why these home remedies worked, why this granny magic worked, why the kitchen witchery worked, she knew it worked. It was tried and true. It was teas and liniments that were passed down from generation to generation in her family, from woman to woman, to help keep their families healthy. And if somebody got sick, these were the remedies that they used because doctors were expensive. Fast forward to when I'm about 14 years old, I get very sick. Unfortunately, right before I got sick, our family doctor, who was also the town coroner, was on a call in the middle of a very rainy night up on the highway, and he was hit by a, a car, and he also passed away. So we had no doctor for a while. So my grandmother's experiments, her magic potions, were a big part of our health care. Of course, if it got real bad, we could go to one town to, to the doctors or we could go to the other town to the doctors. But even in the 80s, it wasn't a thing where you had family health care. just didn't work out that way. Um, health care was expensive even back then, and a lot of people didn't have it. A lot of people really did rely on old wives' tales and kitchen witchery. So I was sick, and uh, a new doctor rolled into town, the quack. We call him the quack. He was a different doctor. He not only practiced Western medicine, but he also was a holistic doctor. At that time, the Back to the Land movement in the 70s was petering out, and those people were moving back into society. And the Back to the Landers, uh, they brought their hippy-dippy ways, their holistic medicine. They're foraging in nature for uh, to cure what ails you. And uh, that is all well and good. And we got one of those in our town, and he became our town doctor. Everybody ended up loving the guy, but um, it was a little bit of getting used to, you know. People, even back then, they wanted the absolute quickest cure possible. And I was very sick, and I was being tested and hospitalized and given all kinds of medication, and it was just making everything all worse. So he sat me down when I was 16, and he said, there are alternatives to Western medicine. Western medicine is not working for you. So we need to find alternatives to get you through whatever this unexplainable thing that is going on in your body is. So he taught me how to meditate. He taught me how to breathe during my medical attacks. He taught me how to um, kind of heal my body with my own mind and, and, and just kind of relax myself to allow whatever was going on in my body to calm down a little bit. And he also introduced me to herbs, and that is when my grandmother's magic potions became more fact than fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, as I learned what certain herbs do, as I learned what herbs my grandmother put in her magic potions, her teas, her little concoctions, her liniments, I realized that there was more science behind my grandmother's kitchen witchery, behind these recipes that have been passed down in my family from generation to generation. There was more science as to why they actually worked than magical mystery. But that still didn't take the uh, magical, mysterious, mystical aura out of concocting liniments and oils and teas. Um, it just, it just had, I just had a better understanding of why these things worked. And I was able to, as my children grew up, make these magnificent magical potions and tweak them out because I had the knowledge of herbs behind me where my grandmother did not. She couldn't put a little bit of this and a little bit of that and subtract a little bit of this because she didn't understand, um, how, in fact, the herbs worked. I have a cat trying to come in. Hang on, guys. 
My cat kind of knows how to use the door handle to get in, but not quite. So she's in and everybody is all happy once again. Now, where were we? We were talking about um, the magic in the mystical magical tea potions that I dispensed to my children when they were not feeling good, as opposed to over-the-counter medications. It's just, it's just a thing in my family. So I actually was able to tweak some of my grandmother's tried and true recipes and pinpoint certain things. Um, when the children had a cold and they could not sleep, we added a little bit of lemon balm to the tea and that is a sedative. So they got a better night's sleep. They were able to actually coast into a nice safe sleep while all the other herbs in the tea did their job and they woke up in the morning fit as a fiddle. And I also followed a lot of different practices, such as when I was a kid and you were sick, you went outside and played anyway. I mean, unless you had pneumonia and had to be bedridden for a short period of time, the minute you were able to get up, you was outdoors playing. And it didn't matter if it was winter or spring, summer, fall, you were outside breathing in the fresh air and cleaning out your lungs, as my grandmothers would put it. My mom used to take me and put me in the carriage when I was a baby, some 53 years ago, and she used to put me on the back porch in the middle of winter. Get that child some fresh air, strengthen up her lungs. My brother, he was uh, born with jaundice, and the remedy for jaundice at the time in the 70s was to put the baby in front of a sunny window and let the sun shine on him to fix the jaundice and it worked uh, my my grandmother my other grandmother she had a lot of wild um, abilities to heal as well as to uh, figure out what's gonna happen in the future one of her greatest abilities was um, I should say one of the things that she did the most was the fresh air treatments and whenever we were sick and we were at her house <laughs> She would open up the bedroom window, take all the covers off of you, hang them out the window so that they could air out and you could air out. And that is, uh, that's how you got better. And uh, it, it was just absolutely amazing what they could do uh, without the aid of uh, over-the-counter or prescription medications, what they could actually help heal. Now, my other grandmother had this most amazing ability where she could tell you what was going to happen before it could happen. And she would do that by sitting in the chair in her front windows. Um, she ended up living in the house that she grew up in, in the end, after her parents died. And she was very close to her grandmother. She lost her grandmother when she was 10 years old, but they did everything together. And she often would take a nap in the front window in her comfortable chair. And she confessed many, many years later when I was starting to have uh, really weird episodes after I uh, had my NDE, um, that her grandmother would come to her and she could feel her grandmother holding her hand while she slept. And then she would wake up. She would know what ailed you. She would know what was coming at you. And she would make a phone call. And not to try to change anything, but to let you know that something was coming down the line at you and you have free will. So you can either go one way or the other way with it. But she kind of was a woman who could give you a heads up as to what was coming at you in life. So she had a lot of cool, amazing, um, little superpowers herself. She was also a person who was a very calm person. So you could sit at her kitchen table and she could, hold your hand, you would talk to her, she would hold your hand, she wouldn't say a word, and by the time she let go, whatever was troubling you no longer really affected you. It was just so amazing. She used to um, call it taking, taking, away, um, taking away what was bothering you, and you do it by holding hands. So that was an amazing thing that she could do. She was just a very comforting woman. And many people, everybody in the family went to her with their family problems, would sit at her kitchen table, have a cup of coffee with her, have a couple cigarettes, and the whole time she would hold your hand, and you would talk, and 
like she said, you were just talking it out and she was just a sounding board. But whatever she did, you left her house without a care in the world. Whatever, like I said, whatever was bothering you, you figured out real quick for whatever reason that maybe you should just kind of let this stuff go. Then we have people in this world that are true walking miracles. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world. There is something that I cannot explain through science. It is absolutely miraculous. It is called blood stopping. There are people in this world that can literally stop you from bleeding and save your life. They can also cure burns and they can cure colic in babies. Now there are two ways, two trains of thought that go about this. There's always two sides to everything, isn't there? There are are people that are um, take this on a very religious aspect where they actually say Bible verses to perform this miracle, faith healing. And then there are other people who say incantations that have been passed to them in a very non-religious um, healing. These people don't have to be near you to use their powers to stop you from bleeding to death. They can be hundreds of miles away. As long as they know of your situation, they can get down to business and you can get to where you need to be to be treated and you will not bleed to death. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, I have met a blood stopper. He is a marvelous man. He lives in town. He's a very old man. He's in his 90s. And I look like the kind of person that he could tell a little bit about this blood stopping miracle too. And that's just what he did. Now there are, like I said, there are two schools of thought with this. One school of thought is anybody can be taught to do this. And another school of thought is it runs in families only. And you have to be the seventh son of a seventh son or the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter. He happens to be a seventh son. Now, in both instances of blood stopping, a man cannot pass the knowledge, the secret, to another male. Women have to pass it to men, and men have to pass it to women. In his thought of um, blood stopping, it is a family thing. It is in the lineage. He does not believe that this Secret or superpower or miracle faith healing can be passed outside of his lineage. He can't pass it to me, but he can pass it to one of his nieces, nephews, his daughter, whoever he feels will use, um, be able to use the power properly because you can pass it to somebody who, who, you know, doesn't use it right. And then they lose it. And that is one of the things across the board about all healing. If you do not respect the gift that you have been given from wherever you have been given it, whether you believe it's through God, whether you believe it's through spirit, whether you believe it's through the universe, whether you believe it's through gods and goddesses, however you have been given this gift, um, if you abuse it, you will lose it. And it is an absolute um, thread that runs through every um, person that does heal. They do have a, uh, a clause, so to speak, that says, you know, if they, if they do abuse their supernatural powers, their superpowers, their healing powers, that they will lose the ability to heal. And it is the same with blood stopping. A blood stopper is not to be compensated. They're not even to be thanked. That is also another thing that goes along. It's a thread that runs through all the healing arts. Um, healers do not want to be thanked. They, know, they do not want to be compensated, most of them. Now, there are some healers that will accept compensation in the form of food that you have grown with your own two hands. Um, they don't want to be bragged on but they will accept small gifts of that nature that they can consume or they can give to other people, um, kind of like a pay it forward, pass it on type of a thing. And 
these are incredible um, miracles. I don't know how they blood stop. It like they, like you said, it's it's a Bible verse that if something happens and he is notified, he doesn't have to be around the person. He says a specific Bible verse, and this person will stop bleeding, and they can get this person to the hospital with the help and care that they need. Also, a lot of uh, blood stoppers, they can cure warts as well. And I have a great story. I was at the hairdresser over the summer, and somehow we got on the conversation, the topic of folk magic. And I know I'm in the room, I'm involved. There, there, somehow we got to folk magic. And I said, when, oh, it was about a sty. Some, the woman that was getting her hair done said that uh, she could feel a sty coming on. And I said, take your wedding ring off if it's gold and rub it, rub it across your eye three times and um, the sty's going to go away. It works. And so we got to talking, and when she was a kid, she was going into high school, she had a terrible condition with warts on her hands, and she was going into high school. You know, she wanted to date boys, and having warts on your hand at, at that age is not, um, it's not the most wonderful experience to go through. So her father decided to send her down the road a piece, because that's what happens in Maine. You go down a road a piece, and he sent her to an older woman, and she sat at this woman's table, and the woman asked her what she needed, and she said that she needed to get rid of the wart. And this woman took her hands and held her hands and said a prayer, and that's about as all, all as she would get because she had to swear to the woman that she would tell nobody what the woman said and exactly how this is performed because the warts would come back, and she's in her 70s now. And she's still not telling. But that's the gist of it. She sat at the woman's table. The woman held her hands and said some kind of a prayer. And she had no warts for the rest of her life. It's just amazing what healing powers people really do have. Now, my daughter-in-law, she doesn't believe in none of this malarkey. She doesn't believe in kitchen witchery. She came to us with... Uh, with a very serious, logical mind, and that is perfectly fine. But even now, you know, she calls me and she says, "This is this is happening." Do you got any tricks? She won't call it. She won't call it granny magic, but she calls it tricks. Do you have any tricks to get rid of this? Do you have any tricks for that? And we give her the tricks, and she's absolutely in awe that um, the herbal medicines work for the children. They work for her, and they work uh, quite expediently. So she's, uh, she's coming around a little bit. We're converting her into the more natural world, so to speak. But sometimes you can't get to the doctor. You can't get the kids to the doctor and using the old ways, using the old wives tales, utilizing knowledge that has passed that been passed down from generation to generation. Sometimes it's just the trick to cure what ails you. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, I hope I've given you a little bit of food for thought today. And please have a great day. Have a wonderful weekend. Carpe diem, because no one promised you a tomorrow.